Is this a good level? Everybody can hear me, I assume? Sounds good. Give you all a second to be seated. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see if I can get used to holding the mic here. Uh, good morning, you all. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm a little impressed that you would all be here to learn about AIO. Uh, the title I was going to do for this is why I hate this so much. I've been doing this for years. Uh, and it never seems to be done or fixed. Uh, so as I was thinking about how to structure this talk, I wasn't quite sure how to approach it. And so I'm trying something a little experimental. This is just sort of a brain dump of the things I think about when I'm working on AIO, uh, the problems we have where I think we should go. You might disagree. Uh, the intent is to have this be a lively discussion. Um, call out, argue, we'll have fun with it. I don't want to just be here reading from slides all morning because that's dull. Uh, so let's get going. Uh, but yeah, so please um, make noise while we're going. Uh, a rough overview of if there is to be a structure in this talk, this will be it. Um, we'll talk a bit about who wants AIO and what they want from it because I think this is often missing from the discussions we have on the mailing lists. Um, the current AIO is built for one use case, essentially. People get frustrated with that, and they throw up a prototype of what they would want. Uh, and it works for them, but it doesn't really work for the other use cases. And we end up in these weird arguments where we pretend that the subsystem um, can only serve one use case, essentially, right? So uh, Linus will be sad about the current AIO stuff because it doesn't work for his case at all. Uh, but the current users of AIO don't want to migrate to something else because that won't work for them. And we somehow never explicitly mention these use cases, so we'll do that. Um, we'll talk about why AIO is hard. Why wasn't this done 10 years ago? What about the kernel makes this a fundamentally hard operation to support? Uh, we'll talk about what the kernel does support today. And I'll try not to make you too sad. Uh, why that's not good enough? Why current users of it are a little, um, they want more, right, rightly so. And why a lot of use cases it just doesn't satisfy. And um, we'll talk about this A call patch set I've been playing with. Um, Initially, I was going to talk about CRFS again this year, but an opportunity presented itself to work on AIO. Uh, so I sent a mail to the program committee and said, hey, I could also talk about this AIO stuff. You know, which one do you guys want? And we thought AIO would be fun. So this A call work is that work I've been doing. Um, it's another set of syscalls. We'll, we'll talk about that. So uh, this is trying to simplify and summarize some of the core users of AIO. Uh, what AIO fundamentally is, is a way to have long running operations be done in the background while your foreground task is doing more productive work. Um, you know, it may be just doing things with the CPU. Uh, it may want to wait for other things. I mean, there's all sorts of things you might want to do while you're not waiting for an IO to go to disk and come back. So this little table describes properties. Well, it's three different use cases at the top of the top and properties of those use cases. Uh, from left to right, it's POSIX AIO. I sort of truncated it to have it fit that tiny little column. Uh, Git is the AIO properties that Linus has described. I'm summarizing as Git here, and we'll dig into that. Uh, DB is for databases, which is my employer, the use case they care about. Uh, so that top row is rather important to realize. Um, operations refer to task state, uh, you know, the tasks UID. It's I.O. scheduling, all sorts of stuff. Uh, the two users get in the database are sort of high-level apps. They know when their task state is going to change. POSIX AIO is a library. It has no idea what its caller has done. When it gets into, when the POSIX AIO library goes to service a read or write, it doesn't know if its caller's UID has changed in the interim. That becomes important later on. But it's a unique property of POSIX AIO as compared to high-level apps that are calling AIO. That's important to realize. And it's these differences in use cases that sort of complicate our discussions that we never really talk about. Uh, operations are likely to block, right? In the POSIX AIO or database case, you've gone to the trouble of using AIO because you know your operations are going to be really slow, and you don't want to wait for them. Uh, in the Git case that Linus talks about, he wants to sort of do it opportunistically. He expects that most cases will be cached and it won't block. But if it does block, he wants to still be able to do other work while it's blocked. And again, that impacts the design of the subsystem. Uh, Predicting I.O. patterns is another case of POSIX AIO being a library. It doesn't know in aggregate how much I.O. is going to be in flight. It doesn't know which I.O.s you're going to wait for. Uh, it's, it's servicing an app. The other two get in the database are high-level apps. They control how much I.O. they have in flight. And again, that impacts the design of the subsystem, and we'll see that in further slides. So why is this so hard to begin with? 
there are fundamental properties of the way the kernel has implemented system call handlers that make this hard. That's why we're having this conversation. Fundamentally, internal kernel APIs block. That's just how we write software. Uh, mutexes, allocation, all sorts of serialization, they block. So if you're writing code to handle an operation and you're using other kernel APIs, you're going to block. Now in AIO, we don't want to block the caller of a system call. But in the kernel, we're going to. So you get into a situation where you want to have another thread executing the system call for you, right? But we're back to system calls fundamentally operate on task state. Uh, they queue signals in the caller's task. They read and write the caller's UIDs, whatever. Um, the way we've implemented tracking that state in the kernel, it, it sort of implicitly, uh, it, the task that is servicing the system call implicitly works on its own task state. may not be worded very well, but we don't, we don't have, like when we're servicing a system call, we don't have an explicit argument that says it's this task that called the system call. We assume we are the person who all the system call stuff should operate on. So, well, this will make more sense in further, further slides, I think. But that's fundamentally why it's hard. The way we've implemented task state and C in the kernel system call handling paths, it's implicit and it's us. We can't say, I'm servicing a read operation for this other task, so I'll go fetch its UID to see if it should be allowed to. Uh, all we know how to do in the API for managing task state in the kernel is say, what's my UID? So we have to have this implicit association between the task that issued a system call and the task that's servicing it. But again, fundamental kernel APIs block, so we're sort of screwed. Uh, this is why AIO is hard. And we'll, yes, Matthew. Yeah, so Matthew points out that Dave Howells has recently done some work to separate out credentials into its own sort of reference structure off the task state. And it's true, uh, that is a direction to go in. Uh, we also do that with the memory mapping struct, the MM, uh, and other things are shared between tasks. But they're sort of, they're high profile exceptions, but that's not the current case, or that's not the common case, right? If, if all the state in a task were treated like that, this would be easier. AI yeah, would be easier to implement. It, Indeed, and we'll talk more about that in the future. Uh, we're going to talk about fibrils and syslets, and those are different approaches to referencing task state. Uh, that might make this make a little more sense. Uh, and also, we can talk about uh, the current AIO support, how it gets around this problem. Uh, there are four system calls. I mean, we don't need to go into this in too much detail. Uh, essentially, when you go to serve an AIO operation in the current code, um, you know, you do the specific submit system call and you specify a read or a write or whatever, the code goes and looks to see if there's a specific implementation of the system call you tried, right? It doesn't just call the generic read system call handler. It goes to see if there's a special AIO read and it starts executing that. Um, this is the most important point. Uh, the code, when you're in this specific AIO system call handler, is cut up into phases. There's an initial submission phase, which executes in the caller, which is allowed to reference task state. Uh, this is when you can a queue signals, uh, reference the UID, all that stuff, you're allowed to look at the caller's task state. But you're still on the submitting caller's task. If you block, you block the submitter at this point. Right? This is all in the submission, sort of the build-up phase. Uh, but once you've done all that and you, you know, kick off an I.O. or something, you're now in the async case. The submitter returns and goes on to do their work. Uh, but in the kernel, to, to complete that operation, you can no longer reference the caller's task struct. If you do, weird stuff will happen, likely. Uh, but in practice, nothing does. And that means the only thing that's actually implemented in AIO is odirect. Uh, because the way odirect works, it builds up these little in-flight IO structures. It builds all that stuff in the submitter's call task, kicks off those BIOs, they're now in flight, and it returns to the caller. And the only phase that's asynchronous is waiting for those BIOs to complete, to come back from disk, and then uh, filling in a little completion structure. Uh, that whole submission phase, there are a lot of things we could do in there and do do that block. Uh, getting file locks, looking up block mappings on disk, pinning user pages that we might have to fault in. All that stuff submits the caller. Uh, 
but we have to do all that stuff in the caller state because we're referencing their task struct. So uh, the way, and that's how we get around having to reference the caller's task state. We just do all the work that references the task state synchronously. And then we only do this little special case bit at the end asynchronously because we know it doesn't need to reference the task state anymore. Um, yeah, we can talk about the ICV stuff. In the kernel, when you're in that async phase, you have to express the operation state in something. And then these little magical structures. So to implement this separate AIO operation, you have to bubble that little structure down to track the operation while it's in flight. And then when it completes, you complete through that little structure. Uh, so what is, I mean, so the key observation here is that to support AIO, we have to duplicate system call handlers, or we just have to change them because they have to be cut up into these phases and they have to reference these IOCVs. So the current kernel AIO support requires changing a lot of code. Things have to know they're asynchronous because they have to know to be cut up into these different phases. Uh, and I argue that that's why in 10 years we have Odorect and nothing else. Uh, I think, does this make sense? Everybody's good? Uh, so this is sort of the properties of it. And the second slide is kind of funny. It's why, why I don't like this stuff. And it's just listing the properties again. All the design points of the current it stuff are its problems. Um, from least to most serious, uh, we, we'll talk about the user space ring in the future. But uh, the current AIO has a way to sort of, well, it, it intends to have a way to get completions from user space without going into a collection syscall. But it's broken. Nothing uses it. Nothing uses it, and yet it's always built up. It's always mapped into user space. It's always allocated in unswappable kernel memory, all this stuff. It's really silly. Um, that submission syscall, the way you kick off these AIO operations, uh, has a little struct that specifies the operation. And as you add each system call, you duplicate its arguments in this little structure. So you want to add an async write. You have to go get all the right system call arguments and pack them into this little structure. So we've, for some reason, given ourselves the maintenance burden of duplicating the entire syscall ABI in this little structure. Um, that's just to get the arguments into the kernel. Once you have that, you now have to implement this special AIO aware system call handling path, the dot AIO underscore things. Right now, it's only AIO read and write. Essentially, there's other stuff, but nothing uses it. Uh, and we talked about that in the last side, right? To support AIO, you have to fundamentally alter your system call handling paths. Uh, and there's really weird properties of it. Like, so we talk about it, um, you know, you, you do the submission phase and then you switch over to the asynchronous phase. The way we indicate that we're now in the asynchronous phase is that we return a magic negative error value. Uh, and that indicates to the caller of these magical AIO variants that, in fact, the operation's still pending. So if you look in like the generic VFS read and write paths, which are used in the special AIO variant, um, usually a negative error return code means it's an error. The operation isn't in flight anymore. That's not the case for these special AIO ops, right? So as you're coming back up through the call chain, you know, you may do cleanup on error unless it's these magical error codes. So there's a bunch of, you know, if read is EIO CBQ'd or EIO CB retry, then don't do this other stuff, right? You, to support AIO, you have to bubble these weird tests all through your code path. And you know, so doing that for disk read and write is one thing. Imagine doing it for rename in the VFS, right? It's a train wreck. And why it doesn't exist, I argue. OK, so where are we with that? And we talked about the task struct stuff. Uh, and so when you think about it, that, that property that you can't reference task state after you've blocked just limits the amount of operations you can fundamentally support asynchronously. Imagine you have an operation that does something to disk and then operates task state. That can never be async in the current infrastructure <laughs> unless the task state you're working on happens to be one of the few that's shared. Uh, so that's, well, that's why I don't like the current AIO. And I hope that at least makes a little bit of sense. Um, we can talk next about, this is sort of a tangent a little bit. Uh, there's a common request we get from AIO users to add something to AIO. And I propose that in the future we not think of adding, adding things to AIO is wrong. We want to add an operation to the kernel and be able to work with it asynchronously. Uh, the lesson here was the adding p read v and p write v, which lets you specify the file offset as well as vectored memory. Uh, we added this to the AIO call chain uh, years ago. I don't remember when it was exactly, two or three years. Uh, and we just now have patches to add the same proper mainline system call. Uh, that's backwards. If you want to do something in AIO, you probably want to do it sync as well. So we should just add the system calls and then st structure our AIO such that they call the generic system calls, right? We don't have to duplicate all this stuff. Uh, and so we keep getting people asking for stuff from AIO. Uh, 
zero copy network receive, being able to push barriers down to disk, uh, vectoring file position in, a diff in addition to the memory stuff. That's all fine, but they don't want it. I mean, I argue that we shouldn't implement it by adding it to these magical special async entry points. I think we should have generic system calls that do these things if they're valuable, and then we can also do them through an AIO entry point that knows to call the generic system call handling paths. Uh, but again, we're back to our generic system call handling paths referencing their task struct rather than the callers, right? That's the fundamental problem. Uh, and that is where we got that, this Fibrils prototype. It's probably a few years ago now. Uh, it got around only being able to operate on your task struct uh, by messing about with the internals and making it so threads that were operating could share a task struct. Uh, you could have multiple system calls being processed and they would reference the same task struct. Uh, and the prototype worked a bit, right? You could do some VFS stuff. It was pretty neat. Uh, there's a funny little tangent here. We have a few things in the task struct that aren't related to the task at all. They're a way to put stuff on the stack without having to pass arguments down the stack. Um, there's a link count for doing following links, I think. Uh, journal info is how a lot of file systems have state for an operation and then reference it throughout servicing the operation without actually explicitly passing that argument around. That doesn't work if you have threads sharing a task struct, obviously, so we had to push that into a truly per thread area, but that was just a fun bit of trivia for this prototype. So it worked a bit, right? But now we have multiple threads doing concurrent access to one task struct in a bunch of old system call handling code that was never written to support that. We'd have to go back and audit all sorts of you know, reads and writes to the task struct to make sure they're safe for racing, right? What happens if you change a UID while you're doing, uh, I mean, the possibilities are endless and that's a huge maintenance burden, right? Uh, so that was one thing. And I think we could go this route, right? If we decided that we wanted to make all task structs, concurrent accesses to the task struct safe, but that's a huge amount of maintenance work. And frankly, I don't think it's gonna happen. That was one prototype that would get around how, how we get over the problem of our generic system call handling pads only operating on their task struct. Uh, syslets were a different approach. Uh, syslets take a slightly different approach. Um, what their main design feature is, is that there's no cost for attempting to do an operation if, in fact, it never blocks, right? So all the current infrastructure, you know, the FSAO.c stuff, requires that you build up a state in which you can submit your operation to, that might be completed asynchronously, but if it's cached, it might just complete. Um, that's, that's a lot of overhead if you're doing a whole bunch of calls and they all are satisfied from cache, right? Uh, so syslets don't have that problem, uh, and they do a neat trick where, I mean, essentially what you do, you just call the normal system call handling path. Uh, you know, you're doing a write or read or whatever, and say you end up blocking in the scheduler, it will recognize that you requested that you go through the syslets path when you block. At that time, you clone off another thread. So you have your initial submission thread now blocked in the kernel doing your read or write or whatever. You have this new thread return to user space at the point where it called the system call. So you can think of it as sort of an implicit clone that only happens if you block. So you now have the submitting program now has a thread blocked in the kernel performing this read or write, and it has another thread, a different thread now returned, and you get a magic return code saying it's still in flight. And this is really interesting, but it's only appropriate for apps that can deal with that semantic, right? Because now you have a new thread. Uh, unless we change some stuff, it has a different thread ID. That's exciting for glibc and thread local storage and all sorts of stuff. Um, but it's an interesting approach because there's no cost if that operation never blocked. If you're just doing a ton of cached VFS ops, you burn through them and you don't pay an overhead. Uh, and that's valuable for the get case when it wants to walk file system metadata and it knows in most cases it'll be cached. But in that initial case, when it's cold, you want to push out as much parallel work as possible. Uh, so I think we want to support syslets, but they're not universally applicable and they require that the application dealing with them be pretty clever, which is fine, right? Uh, so those were two prototypes that we've seen. Uh, so this ACOL stuff that I'm working on is intended to just be a minimal submission and completion infrastructure that is flexible enough that you could, if you so desired, you could go through a path that's more like the current stuff where you know it's gonna block, 
or you could say, I'm a very clever app. I don't mind dealing with different threads coming back to me. I want to do syslet stuff. Uh, this is intended to be sort of a piece of infrastructure that supports all these different varied cases. And the rest of the slides will be going through this in more detail. Uh, so this patch, if you go and grab it, it's teeny. It's a few system calls. We'll get into that in the next slide. Uh, it maintains a pool of threads that can either, in theory, be those threads that return from user space, or they can be the threads that get the operation to serve. Um, personally, I'm aiming to have them satisfy POSIX AIO library. Uh, so that's the use case I'm headed towards, but I intend to get the other use cases in the future as well. Uh, syslets are a little more complicated because you have to have little stubs that let you return to user space at specified addresses, so it's a little more work, and that'll just be the next step, I think. Any questions? How are we doing? Everybody loves AIO? Woo! Okay, here are the four system calls that, can you guys read that stuff? Is that too teeny? It seems pretty good, I don't know. Uh, there's only four system calls, and these are the, the various structures that support this stuff. Uh, what is important here, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think it's pretty straightforward, but uh, the submission call, there's no state to build up beforehand. Uh, the submission call, you specify a number of these little structures and that tells you uh, that flags member lets us tune the behavior as we've been talking about. Uh, the system call number, the arguments to the system call. So we don't have to duplicate all the system call APIs here, we just pass it on to the generic paths. Uh, there's these three pointers and uh, yeah, I guess we can talk about that now. Um, if you fill in the completion ring pointer, the result of the operation goes into this ring of completions. Uh, if you just fill in the completion pointer, you don't have to worry about the ring, you'll have a specific completion in memory it'll write to. Uh, if you want to reference the operation while it's in flight, and there are a few reasons you want to do that, uh, where you see the A call ID pointers up in the ABI, that's where you want to do that. You can have a unique ID generated for this operation if it's in flight. If you don't, because you're only going to wait in a ring, you don't have to pay the cost of allocating that ID. Uh, the IDs are used either to wait for completion for a set of pending events or to cancel them. Uh, and I don't really talk about this in the slides much, but cancellation is implemented by sending a signal to the task that's processing a system call. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the ABI, and what is, is uh, I think that's all that's really interesting there. We'll talk about the ring in more detail because it's cool. Uh, yeah. So why go to the trouble? Glibc today implements POSIX AIO with thread pools in user space. Why isn't that good enough? And yes, Matthew. Well, because it has one type of power and there's weird reasons for that. But in the general case, um, why is this not good enough? Why shouldn't Oracle have a bunch of threads sitting around to do DIO to disk for a bunch of concurrent I.O.? Um, these are the only reasons I could come up with. Uh, and you know, you can make decisions for yourselves where you think they're sufficient or not, but this is what I could come up with. And fundamentally, it's all because the kernel has a much richer access to the scheduler. Um, say you do this user space thread pooling stuff you couldn't really do the syslet variant where you have no cost if it doesn't block. Because all you can do is hand your operation off to a thread and it'll go and execute it. And in the cache case, you'll switch to that thread, it'll execute it without blocking and it'll come back to the caller, right? You paid a pretty high price on the off chance that it blocked and it never did. Uh, because in the kernel, we can do stuff when you block in the scheduler. That's something you can do in the kernel when we push the submission path into the kernel that you couldn't do in user space. Uh, Thread pools in user space, uh, you have to bounce completions through a thread that's waiting. Uh, it, the user space doesn't really have as rich an access to the waiting API in the kernel that the kernel does, obviously. Uh, it's harder to build up complicated waiting structures, so you end up paying a bit of overhead. Uh, there, there's other weird ones, like currently libUSB, its use of AIO, uh, because, because the path that is now AIO aware dictates when you return to the caller by returning that magic return code. LibUSB relies on this, implying that operations are served in the order that they're submitted in. Each IO in turn, in their subsystem, they let it get to a sufficient point on hardware before they return that it's now async. Uh, and that lets them not get reordering in amongst the submission arguments. Uh, you can't really do that from user space, right? Unless you do them all serially. You don't know when a thread in user space 
that's off in the kernel has blocked at a sufficient point that it's now sort of its order is committed if the order is determined by a subsystem. I don't know if we actually want to support this because I'm not sure that ordered AIO is the right model. If they wanted an ordered queue, they should have used something like a socket that's an ordered queue. But that's another argument to have. Um, there's another weird case. We're going to talk more about how we migrate state between tasks uh, to maintain the right semantics. Uh, and we can do stuff in the kernel. We can migrate state between tasks a lot more efficiently than user space can. Uh, user space just has the read and write paths for a lot of the state. But there are some things that, is just not, that aren't exposed. The only way they can inherit task state from one task to another fundamentally across the board is to clone a new thread. For some things in the task struct, there aren't ways to update it after the fact. Uh, and, and maybe that'll make more sense in the future, I hope. Uh, and we talked about not being able to defer the cost until blocking, because we're not, in user space, we don't have access to the scheduler. We don't know when one of these threads is finally blocked. Uh, so because we want, oh, here, I'll give you this next slide. Because we want the thread that's servicing this op to have the same task state as the caller, we need to inherit a lot of the task state from the caller. And obviously, the easiest way to do, it is, do that is to clone a new thread as you go to service each operation. Uh, that can be pretty expensive. <laughs> uh, I mean, it depends on you know the ratio of your CPU speed to how many operations you have in flight, all this stuff. Uh, as I've been benchmarking this stuff, um, on boring rotating metal on modern CPUs, you don't notice the overhead. It's nothing. Uh, if you get a shiny SSD from a certain Linux-friendly company that does 30k ops a second, boy, do you notice this. Your CPU use goes through the roof. Uh, and it's because we do some kind of strange things at clone time. Um, we get a very accurate measure of when the thread started. So if you're doing 30k hardware time requests a second, especially if you're using the ACP IPM clock source, that it melts your box. Um, I could imagine that we could make clone a little more efficient, um, you know, squeezing some global locks out of there, doing something clever with that start time. Uh, we do things like we just do a mem copy of the whole struct, and then we go back willy-nilly and pepper updates of specific fields throughout. We could reorder that so we only do one writing pass through the structure. But that sounds like noise, right? We're not fundamentally going to make clone cheaper. It's an incredibly hot path, right? It's been well optimized. So if we can't make clone cheaper, we need a way to update the task state we care about specifically. And this is when it starts to get contentious, right? You could imagine that the API could let you say, oh, just update the task state that's related to file I.O. So it's UID and GID and all the effective IDs and the I.O. scheduler and all that stuff. Uh, but that sounds pretty fiddly. Uh, but it'd be really fast. You now have a thread waiting. Uh, you'd pick it as the one that's going to service your op, and you'd just update the little task state fields that you care about. But how you'd communicate to the user, or how the user would communicate which task state needs to be updated as the kernel evolves is sounds pretty sketchy. Um, and POSIX AIO, it's a library. It doesn't know what state the caller cares about for this operation. So it may always have to clone. Uh, that's kind of disappointing. But maybe that's life, right? If we want to have generic system calls be asynchronous, we might just pay this cost. That's life. Uh, the current A-call patches, if you go and look at it, uh, they can maintain a thread pool, and a caller can specify that they want an operation to be serviced by a waiting thread. And that's fine when you're an app like uh, Git or KVM or something where you know that your task state hasn't changed. right? Uh, you know that it's fine to use a stale thread. Uh, and that really goes fast. We did some clever stuff in there, so we only do one lock to grab a waiting thread. Uh, this is just for updating the task state on submission time, right? Uh, we have a similar problem on the completion side. Your operation has been going in another thread. It's done. And now we want the results of that operation, if they modify the task struct, to be updated in the caller, right? Uh, my cheesy example of all this stuff right now is the ridiculous quota exceeded signal that in the current syscall ABI, if you try to do an AIO right and you exceed your quota, you'll have a pending signal when you return. If we want to continue maintaining that, we'll have to learn to migrate state from the task struct back to the caller. No one likes this. It's nasty. But if we decide that this semantic is what we want to support, then we'll start doing that. Um, this is just another thing that's always discussed in the AIO community, whether or not or how we support this. I'm not sure I have the right answer, but that we have to consider this. And this, this affects the syslet case. If 
if you decide you want to support these semantics, right? If your caller is clever enough to know that it, that a signal that was raised in the operation is now off in some other thread somewhere, uh, may, maybe that's how it'll operate, but that sounds pretty, pretty bad. Uh, and stuff like async set UID, what does that do, right? Do we just forbid that up because it's silly because set UID never blocks? Um, do we migrate it back to the caller? And if we, in all these cases, if we're migrating back to the caller, we now have to be careful. We have to make sure the caller doesn't go away, but that's relatively easy. We have to make sure that if the caller is referencing this stuff while we're updating it, that's safe. That implies, you know, making a bunch of stuff in test strict shared again. And maybe in the end, it won't be that much that people in practice care about, and we'll just do that work. That may be the answer. Uh, but this is, these are the sticking points, right? How we migrate task between task structs if we're going to have threads doing generic paths. Yes? I'm told that say what ID blocks and allocates memory and can block, but allocating memory, it's kind of a special case because fundamentally, if you issue more work than the box can serve at one time, you're going to block someone somewhere. Blocking for memory allocation is not that big a deal. Well, exactly, right? Why would we care? <laughs> it's like asynchronous git pit. Who the hell cares? Um, but it's another example of something that updates the task struct to give you an idea of those kind of operations. So those are the hard bits, I think. Um, I think the rest of the slides are kind of the fun stuff, right? So we'll start talking about them. Um, the way POSIX AIO is written to wait for events, um, the current kernel AIO stuff is a terrible match for. And I don't know if I blame the current AIO stuff that I hate or the POSIX AIO stuff that I hate, but the combination together is not great. Um, in POSIX AIO, you issue a write against a little bit of memory. Now that's in flight. If you want to wait for a set of those to return, you just specify the set, right? It's like pull. It's instead of a list of file descriptors, it's a list of pending AIO ops. And you're woken when one of them completes. Uh, it's important to realize that the POSIX AIO library has no idea how many may be issued, nor which sets of those may be waited on. Our AIO system call API requires you to explicitly build up a state that has a fixed limit to the amount of IOs that can be pending, and then you wait for anything to complete in that state. So you can imagine if you're an AIO library and you wanted to do this, and there are at least two implementations that try to support POSIX AIO through our kernel system call, infrastructure, what they end up doing is allocating these ginormous global state for, a, for the kernel AIO, and they submit all their IOs against it. Then when they're asked to wait for something, they wait for anything to hit the ring, they sweep all the completions to see if it's any of the ones they were waiting for, and then they go back to sleep if it wasn't. So you can imagine a bunch of threads doing this. They'll all be submitting IO against one bit of state. They'll all go to sleep waiting on that. They'll all wake up. Almost all of them will find that it's not the ones they care about, and they'll all go back to sleep. It's garbage. Uh, that's one of the reasons why POSIX AO doesn't use our system calls. Uh, and if you look at the patches that do, they have these giant global things, and they do these passes, and it's, it doesn't scale. So obviously, in the A call infrastructure, uh, and Ulrich pointed this out in my first prototype, he yelled at me, what we now have is just an ability to build up in the kernel um, wait queues for all the IOs that are in flight. So when you go to wait on each of those operations in the kernel, we build up little wait queue entries on each of those operations, and then you go to sleep. And then in the completion path, you wait the entry that completed. That wakes the people who are waiting, and they notice that it's theirs, and they return user space. Uh, this is one of the uses of the ID, and it means we have to index that ID in the kernel. We have to allocate it. So there's overhead. And if you don't need the ID, and you're never going to use the silly waiting semantic, then you don't pay that overhead, which is kind of nice. Uh, and again, the semantic analog is pull. Uh, and again, it's sucky in all the ways that pull is. Um, here's those IDs. They're kind of clever. Um, to user space, they're just a big blob of bytes. In the kernel, it's a CPU number and a counter, as it turns out, in this implementation. Uh, they're only allocated when user space assigns that ID pointer in the little submission struct, and that tells us where in memory to write this ID as we've allocated it. Uh, because it's a CPU number and a counter, we can allocate a unique ID without having to serialize on anything. That's important because we're writing this ID we generated to user space. That might fail with eFault. So if we can throw away that ID without having to go and lock some structure and pull it back out, 
uh, that's that's nice. So we allocate these things without serialization. We try to write them to user space. If it succeeds, we go and index them in a data structure. If not, who cares? We're done. We return to user space with default. Uh, and these IDs are also used to specify uh, an operation for cancellation. If something's in flight and you want to, as you submit an I.O. and you know you may want to cancel it, you ask to have an ID generated. As it's generated, we index the task that is processing the ID based on the ID. So that in the cancel call, you can say, eh, go kill that ID. We look it up, we get the task, we send a signal. So that's the IDs. Um, I think they're relatively reasonable. Uh, if you compare them with the current AIO IDs, you have a pretty good time. They're, uh, they're different. <laughs> the, the current AIO ID is the memory address that that stupid ring was mapped to in user space. It's really silly. OK, the, this ring is fun. This has been a long, it's sort of a pet peeve of mine, the current AIO ring. It's not great. Um, when you ask to have an AIO context allocated, the kernel allocates um, a bunch of memory to hold all the completions that you specified and a little structure in front of it. And it maps that whole thing somewhere into user space memory. You have no say as to where the kernel calls do MMAP for you uh, and returns the pointer. Uh, that was kind of fun. I've had requests from guys who are trying to migrate processes between machines. They want to build up process state on another box, and they now the application knows there's a ring at a specific address, but that infrastructure that's migrating tasks can't ask the kernel to reestablish that mapping, right? Because um, there's no way to explicitly say, I want a context at this address. So they would need kernel patches to be able to migrate tasks around. It's just goofy. Um, so in, ideally, even if we had kernel allocated memory for context, the user could specify where they ended up or what it, how are they addressable. Um, if you look at the head and tail semantics, so it's a ring, right? There's a head and tail index, and they advance as you produce and consume events off of it. They're backwards. If you have ever worked with rings at head and tail, and you expect that to be what the, it's not, it's the opposite. Uh, and the head and tail are stored modulo the size of the ring. Uh, so zero and zero means both empty and full, and that would be fun. So instead of that, when you ask, say you ask for a ring that has two events, there are three slots so that you can now have 0 and 2 indicate full instead of 0 and 0. Great, so now we have head, tail, and length. Uh, and that's kind of fun to read through the code and understand that, right? Because you expect head and tail to work the same as every Ethernet card you've ever worked on. Um, and so the intent here is that we're working with these rings from user space. The kernel will be in queuing events, and user space will be plucking them back off. To serialize between the kernel and user space, you might want to use compared exchange. Sounds reasonable. Um, but they're wrapped values, right? Uh, as it hits the end of the ring, it becomes zero again. So if you try to do a compare and exchange on that zero value, you may think your compare and exchange succeeded, uh, but it may have wrapped all the way around, and now you just advanced it again based on state you didn't understand. And it turns out this only really matters if you were only using compare and exchange to serialize between user space threads removing events, which is probably rare, but there's no way you would <coughs> see this bug coming unless you'd been working in this code for two years, right? You would end up losing events if you raced in a really terrible way. Uh, and this next bit's kind of interesting. Um, so say you have the intent, right, is to have user space look at this ring, grab an event. So it's going to be looking at either the head or the tail, whichever it is that implies that there's a waiting event. Uh, when it sees that head or tail having advanced, it's going to now look at the position in the ring for that event. It's going to read it and process it. Um, there's no way to look at a given event and see that it's complete. Uh, so the kernel has to write the event before it updates the, the value, right? The head or the tail index. And that means the kernel can't use the update, a parent exchange of that head or tail to indicate that it reserved that position. Um, it has to have a spin lock in the kernel to, it locks the ring, it fills in the event, it advances the head or tail and it unlocks. Uh, and that's not cool because it, it would have been nice if we could use compare and exchange to serialize writers in the kernel. Uh, and so the ACAL ring does all that stuff. Um, it's entirely in user space memory. There's no explicit kernel state that you have to mess with. Uh, you just, in the submission call, you just hand a user space pointer to the kernel and you say, this ring structure is there and there's enough events after it to, to satisfy the ring, right? Uh, in the completion there, that's 
the element of the ring, right? There's a bunch of those. It's the return code of the system call and a cookie that user space specifies. That cookie has to be non-zero. That's how user space can recognize that a given event is full. It notices there's a non-zero cookie. Yeah, the the ring is, well, well uh, that'll be clear, I think, when I talk about what the writing kernel task does. It's only, this is only uh, referenced with, uh, you know, CPU stores, right? There's no pinning of pages or anything. It's just the thread tries to write to that address. If it faults, it faults, right? Um, so when the kernel task goes to add an event to the queue, it does a compare and exchange on head, and when that completes, it knows it's reserved the previous value of head, right? So it wanted to write to slot zero. It doesn't compare and exchange to one. When that succeeds, it now owns slot zero. It writes the return code, does a write barrier, and writes the cookie. So now what user space can do to complete that is watch the head until it changes. When it does change, watch the cookie until it's non-zero, and now you can read the return code. That's it. Uh, and we have prototypes of this stuff. There's an FIO backend that uses it. Um, in practice, you end up spinning between when you read the head and then waiting for the non-zero cookie. So maybe you go and do other application work, or you you know do the rep knob CPU idle thing, or whatever, or a few texts if you wanted to do it that way. Yeah, yeah. This is just one way to serialize, obviously, between the user space and kernel. I think it's simple and pretty straightforward. But we could also do few text stuff, which I think is nastier because now you have to tear them down if they are held and you die. Um, I think that's really it for this a call stuff. Uh, so you can go look at the patch, it's tiny. There's, um, there's trivial little example apps that show you how to submit and wait and cancel, and there's a patch to Yen's Expo's FIO tool that lets you measure a bunch of concurrent I.O. going on. Uh, so I'm going to continue working on this. Uh, we're going to see if we can get POSIX AIO supported reasonably, um, and then I think I'll send out little mails talking about this stuff. Um, that implies finding some kind of solution for migrating the test state around. Uh, and there are other weird implications to this, or at least not obvious implications. Um, right now, we can't have concurrent direct I.O. writes if they're synchronous. If we were to go to having generic sync writes uh, being how we implement AIO, we'd want to be able to have concurrent DIO writes, which is kind of fun. But it just means releasing and locking more magic locks in the DIO path, and it's not on the same file. So right now in AIO DIO with the FSAIO.C code, uh, you can have you know, writes to block zero and block four million be concurrent. If we had kernel threads doing those synchronously to implement AIO, they would wait for each other. Right? They, they hold the I mutex. Um, so we'd have to release it while it's in flight. And that's effectively what the current AIO DIO code does, but it does it with magic additional locks and all sorts of stuff. Um, so I think we have a little under 10 minutes, I think. Um, so we can just have a fun discussion. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question is how you'd integrate this waiting mechanism with other existing mechanisms. Um, my answer to that usually would be, or one answer to that is that you would issue all the other waiting mechanism syscalls in this. If you wanted to wait for epoll FDs, you'd have an epoll wait being issued as one of these AIO syscalls. Uh, that would be one way to do it, right? But we could also have, the, have some kind of file descriptor um, that would be the state you'd be waiting on for these system calls. But then you're back to the problem where you have to allocate that descriptor to be able to issue these AIO ops, right? Um, so it's not so much that if you had uh, one answer is that if you have an existing epoll wait loop, and you want to start working with these, you might want to switch over that wait loop to being an A call wait loop. And then you'd issue epoll events inside that A call wait loop. But that may not be appropriate for all apps. And then we get into the situation where we want to have a specific FD for this. And you would issue a sys epoll wait as an A call syscall. Right, so anything that A poll can wait on, this can sort of implicitly wait on because you can issue an epoll wait as a system call in here. Well, you do, right, so you'd end up having to do the epoll collection thing, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but you'd get, you'd get an a call event that says an epoll wait returned, right, and then you're as though your epoll wait just returned in your loop, right? <laughs>
I think I could make it make sense if we had time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, so you, yeah. If you have an FD-centric weight loop existing, we can also do what AIO did and be able to do oh, what are those things called, like event FD or signal FD? Or, I think it's event FD, uh, where you have a specific file descriptor that will wake epol or pull waiters when something happens. That's what AIO does today. Um, yeah. You add a layer. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to imply that that option was the best option, but it's an existing option if you wanted to prototype stuff. Uh, but it's really easy, and it's on the to-do list to add that event FD path. Um, more complicated would be expressing the ring as a descriptor where you could read events off instead, right? I mean, but that's certainly, yeah, yeah. Yes. So there are some other systems around that claim to support AI. I don't know any numbers about Not a lot. Do they, um, questions, do they work or are they alive? Yeah, so the, the observation is that there's lots of systems that support AIO and do they work or not, and I suspect they do. Uh, but I think they, so POSIX AI only specifies disk and network read and write. And I think everybody just has special paths. I don't actually know. I don't know of anything that lets you do async renames, right, or make DIRs or anything interesting in the file system namespace universe. Uh, probably for the same reasons that they have to migrate task struct around, task state around. But I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't follow other OS's how they do async stuff. Anything else? How are we doing? More time? Five minutes, four minutes, something? Yes? So the with So that's what the current AIO stuff does today. If you support an AIO op, you're migrating state from the task struct to the IOCB if you need it after you block. And I mean, I think my observation to that is that that's been possible for a decade and it hasn't happened, right? I mean, maybe tomorrow some institute will want to dotate, donate $10 billion a year for developers to start implementing AO in the kernel, but it seems unlikely. Um, so my perspective is that the path is to try and get infrastructure that's just good enough to be able to support the generic system call pads. And I honestly don't know if it's going to be a giant untenable amount of work to start pushing stuff between the task structs, or if it's in practice a small working set and we don't actually care. <laughs> um, but that's sort of the next step in this, I think, for me. Well, that's the thing, right? So the question is, how much of the task struct do you just look at the beginning as you start the submission and never look at again? Um, it depends on the op. And do we want to be in the business of auditing every AIO op, as it, right? I mean. In the current AIO infrastructure, you're not allowed to block after you've returned this magic thing, right? And that means, whether people realize it or not, that any time they're touching a kernel helper that is used by the AIO paths, uh, they're bound by the requirements of that weird bit of kernel infrastructure, right? And today, nobody knows that, right? Um, I think there's like three people in the universe who understand the existing AIO stuff. Um, so I'm not thrilled by having to do this micro-auditing of migrating task structs data around, but I don't see a way out of it, unless we truly have task structs shared and now we've taken on this giant auditing burden. I think in practice, we'll do a pass through the task struct and realize that a lot of it we just don't care about. And the few things we do care about, we'll write some specific migration helpers and be done with it. I mean, it's like signal stuff and maybe BSD accounting if people want to be all clever, but um, I, think, I think that's just the discussion we have to have. Anything else? Everybody knows much more than they wanted to know about AIO. Yes? Sure do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if we were to head in this direction, will we delete more than we added? Um, if we were able to support the current semantics of FSAO.C with something else, yeah, we could get rid of a ton of code that's just nonsense. There's 
an entire path on the current AIO infrastructure that lets you sort of retry ops. So we, we said there were phases, right? You do a submission phase, and then there's an async completion phase. There's a third mode where you can process submission up to a point, realize you're stuck, ask the kernel to retry again once you've made progress. Uh, only some USB thingy supports that, and it's buggy as all get up. And we could just wipe out all that code. Uh, and the other observation is that we would pull IOCB out of the generic file system paths that no one ever references, right? All that stuff would just vanish. It'd go back to being a file pointer instead of an IOCB. Um, and that would please me. But it sounds like we're... One more question, I guess, if there are any. Ooh, AIO, yeah! Nobody wants to take over as the guy who gets email from AIO? That would be, that would be pretty great. Uh, but yeah, I guess we're done. I, I hope it was informative. Um, this is the stuff we, the AIO maintainers, worry about when we mess with this stuff. So thank you all for coming.